inordinately, it becomes a poisonous thing. Don. The question is, are there any examples um, of Genesis 3.16 that we can maybe see in Scripture? Uh, anybody want to take a stab at that? Yeah, Esther. Esther 1. Yeah, that's right. Uh, C- Queen Vashti uh, doesn't want to submit and um, wants to do her own thing. Um, Proverbs 7. Her husband's away. And... Um, and now um, she goes after uh, uh, other men. And the uh, wisdom of Proverbs 7 is um, stay away. <laughs> Isaac and Rebecca, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that there are a number of them. First John 2.16, For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. So we're just unpacking here that now in a fallen world, just because you have a desire does not mean that it's a good thing from God. Already that should be popping modern balloons um, that, that kind of float our way in many different forms. Just because you desire something doesn't mean that it's good and to be gone after and that it's therefore of God. Romans 7.15 For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. 2 Timothy 3, 6-7 For among them, that is, um, these false teachers that are sneaking into churches, for among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. Here, um, the Greek, Keith, if I remember correctly, the Greek here, and Jeremy, you were there for that conversation too, the Greek for um, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions corroborates back to the weak women and not to the false teachers, if I remember correctly. Um, And so what's going on here is a description that there are these women who are burned down with sin and are led this way and that way by different desires and wants. Um, And because they're kind of tossed to and fro by the wayward winds of their own desires, these false teachers are easily able to get in and say, hey, I can help you. And then they lead them astray into um, even worse ideas. Galatians 5.24. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Simply put, if you're born again and now in Christ, your desires, which are connected to the sinful flesh, have been crucified with Christ. Just at a very simple level, think about the language that's being used here by Paul. The same way in which the Roman guards arrested and crucified our Lord, now Christians are supposed to do with their desires, their wayward desires. Drag it out into the light, mock it, and do all that you can to kill it. Lastly, Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins, among, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. So be it the lust of wanting to drink too much, be it the lust of of hedonistic pleasure, be it the lust of trying to get rich, no matter the ethics behind it. The unbelieving person is driven by these so that they cannot help but carry out the desires that bubble up within their heart. This is contrary to the way and the order in which God has created us to first desire Him, and then all things rightly ordered under that. Any questions with this first catechism question and answer? What happened to our desires in the fall of our first parents, Adam and Eve? 
All the desires of the human heart, even though they may be unchosen, have become distorted and fallen in the sin of our first parents. These desires can since we have a natural tendency to be led away by various passions. What questions do you have? All right, next question. But didn't God create us to be happy in following the desires of our hearts? Good question. Answer. God made us holy and happy. We, however... Accepting the lie of the devil have robbed ourselves of this happiness by obeying sinful desires. So yes, God did make us holy and happy. And insofar as Adam and Eve never fell, our desires would have continued to be rightly directed at God. And therefore, uh, we could pray that uh, you know, uh, the Lord would give us the desires of our heart and he would answer it. Why? Because the desires of our heart were in line with his desires. That's not true anymore now that we've fallen. But looking at the good aspect, Genesis 1.31, God saw everything that he made, and behold, it was very good. So we're getting at the idea now that, okay, our desires are warped and fallen and twisted and, and skewed and perverted. Does that mean that God created us that way? Is God to blame? And the answer is no. God created us perfect and holy and good. Psalm 8, verses 5 through 9. Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea. Whatever passes along the paths of the sea, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. The psalmist here in Psalm 8 is getting at the idea that he created us to rule. And in our good and holy desires, we would have ruled the world well. Just think about that environmentally. Um, you know, I think it is good and right for man to rule the world. And yet now fallen, our desires do that in weird ways where we oftentimes have no checks and balances on how we rule and domineer the world. Um, like, I think you really can cut too much of the rainforest down. You can get weird with um, mass agri-farming that pumps animals that God created with stuff that's probably not good to consume too much of, and yet, for money, we just go haywire with it. I'm not saying, you know, I'm not buying in, we ought not to buy in to um, a kind of um, neo-pagan view that exalts and worships the creation, the world, and says things like, ah, what we need to do is get rid of humanity. No. <laughs> we need humanity to rightly rule the world as God created us to, but to do so with self-control and discipline. Genesis 3.6. Here's where we believe the lie of the devil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes, do you see her desires now getting wrapped up? And that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her. And he ate. Psalm 14, verses 1 through 4. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do ab uh, abominable deeds. There's none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. But they've all turned aside. Together they've become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Have they no knowledge, all the evildoers who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord? That last line, um, who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord. I think that's a subtle reference back to Genesis 4 and 5, where Genesis 4 ends with this genealogy of Cain, the sons of Cain. And, um, and it's a picture of desire gone fully awry, where there is no self-control, and it ends with the great-great-great-grandson of Cain marrying seven wives and killing people and boasting in it, saying, where is God? 
He is the fool who says, does God even know? Genesis 5 begins with the line of Seth. And it says, as soon as Seth was born, in those days, men, those men began to call upon the name of the Lord. Cain and his descendants go down. Seth and his descendants worship and pray, call upon the name of the Lord. I think um, that's what's going on here at the end of Psalm 8. Oh, Psalm 14. Or Romans 3. None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. That language of seek is the language of volition, of desire. You seek what you want. If you don't want it, you're not going to seek it. No one wants God. We all come into this world actually increasingly not wanting to want God insofar as God's saving grace doesn't impede our wayward desires. So the question and answer again, didn't God create us to be happy and following the desires of our heart? God made us holy and happy. We, however, accepting the lie of the devil, have robbed ourselves of this happiness by obeying simple desires. Any questions there? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We talked about that last week. I made a little bit of reference here where that was true of Adam and Eve. But yeah, when we get to redemption, um, we'll look at that more. And, and just briefly, once our hearts are born again, our desires, which bubble out of our heart, connected to our heart, um, you know, they are now reoriented to rightly desire the highest good, the most beautiful being that there is, right? And insofar as we continually do that, then the rest of our desires are in line with his will and desire. And so, yes, uh, born-again believers can increasingly find themselves um, desiring right things, and then the Lord is pleased to answer the prayers when we say, Oh, Father, I pray for so-and-so to come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. And God's like, Yeah, that's what I want too. Boom. And he doesn't do it in like, a, oh, I never thought of it. Uh, he, he does it in a way, yep, I sovereignly have been working all things out so that you pray that prayer in right desire with my desire and, and, and bring things to be. Yeah, great question. So he ought to have, uh, at that moment, stepped on the head of the serpent and, um, and not listen to the desire of his wife. And yet you see this reversal where not only does the woman listen to the desire of an animal, remember men and women are supposed to rule over animals, but now the husband listens to the desire of his wife. Everything is topsy-turvy. Yeah, and I, I, I'm not sure it is a command. I think grammatically it's more an indicative. Um, and, and I think, you know, in that, in that, that comes in the curse, right, in Genesis um, 3.16. Uh, I tend to think that, yes, he will rule over her, but in a fallen world, sometimes that looks ungodly. Anger rules. And... Um, and um, he, you know, the husband isn't doing what Peter says to be gentle um, and caring and what Paul says, love your wife. So just think of Ephesians 5. He starts, uh, wives, submit to your husbands in all things as unto the Lord. And then you expect him to say, now husbands, rule your wives. Submit, rule. He doesn't. He says, husbands, love your wives, which is the right balance so that one, you're not doing what Adam did, and you become a kind of pushover. But two, you also don't do what Lamech uh, or um, Cain 
and, um, and his descendants did, where you become this aggressively sinful tyrant. Paul, I think, rightly balances it in love, and he says, love as Christ loved. There's ruling there, there's leading, but it's tethered by love. There's um, gentleness there, but it's tethered by love, so you don't, you, know, you don't go into the pushover realm. I think Paul absolutely nails it in a right balance. Next question and answer. Keith, question. Yeah, question. And you can you know, just shove this to the side and not deal with it if you want. Um, but within kind of you know, modern evangelicalism, uh, you know, air quotes, Christian, there's uh, kind of an understanding from Romans 1, right, which is very clear. It talks about, you know, God giving them up to the lusts of their hearts. Yep. Uh, it, you know, two verses later, God gave them up to their passions, dishonorable passions. Um, there's kind of this modern understanding that, um, for example, homosexuality, the Bible is, is okay with it because God is giving them up to those things. In, in other words, he's, he's allowing it to happen, and therefore it's, it's, it's okay. Huh. Um, I've never heard that argument. Oh, yeah? I, I, I believe that you've heard it. Uh, I'm astounded by it because the whole context of Romans 1 is judgment. Yeah. Um, it's a good segue. Can I take that and answer it with the next catechism? Absolutely. Answer? Question. But isn't there a difference between temptation and the practice of evil desires? Answer. God requires that we avoid entering into all forms of temptation. Temptation is not a sin when it originates outside of us. Temptation becomes sin when we entertain and welcome the sinful desires of our hearts and act upon them. Now, this will be unpacked later. Uh, we'll go through these verses, but I just want to just, I know your minds are going there. Um, in the modern, quote-unquote, evangelifish world, um, um, there is a misnomer that you can be a, um, a gay Christian. Right? So that you have the desires. And the desires in themselves are not bad. It's only bad when you act on it. This question is going to start to unpack, I think, rightly. No. Yes, there are some temptations that are out there. And insofar as you handle that out there temptation well, uh, it's not a sin. But there are other desires that in and of themselves are sinful. And so I'm just, I'm, I'm kind of getting ahead of what I think is probably going through some of your minds. Some desires that bubble up within you, i.e. Um, uh, attraction to the same sex, uh, even if you don't act on it, that desire itself needs to be put to death. We'll get there in time, but I'm, I'm just kind of wanting to preempt where, where I think prophetically, I think some of your minds are going, not, I'm not a prophet. All right. Matthew 6, 13. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think of an example. I've got a weird one, and I think it's weird enough that I'm not going to say it. Genesis 39, 6 through 12. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge, and because of him he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. Now, Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. Just stop there. We know where the story is going, um, Joseph and Potiphar's wife. Now, Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. Half the room right now has a mental image of Joseph handsome in form and appearance, right? And perhaps even that mental image can itself 
become an evil, even just the image. No one knows what Joseph looks like. He's got this, oh, he's handsome and form and appearance. Boom. The other half of the room reads that line and also has a mental image of Joseph. But insofar as, you know, I, I'm thinking of Joseph right now, there is no desire that bubbles up in my mental image of Joseph that makes me want to do anything sinful. So I'm just kind of unpacking in a weird psychological form here the way in which even a mental image that is bubbled up within all of our hearts for some can instantly become sinful, for others might become sinful and not, and for others isn't even really there as a, as a temptation. Does that make sense? Yes, some you don't even choose. And it's just, it, in your wayward, fallen heart, it gets control and you're off on, on some whirlwind of, of a thought process. Continuing on. After a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house. And he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house uh, than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you, because you are his wife. And then this great line, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? You expect him to say against Potiphar, but he says against God. And she spoke to Joseph day after day. He would not listen to her, to lie beside her or to be with her. This is, this is typological of Christ. The temptation's there. He says no. And so the temptation ramps up. Now at this point, the vast majority of us are like, I give up, with whatever temptation it is. Often, we just, as it keeps onslaughting, wave after wave, think of like the Lord of the Rings and the orcs just you know, crushing the castle. At some point, we're like, eh, I have no more strength left. Not Joseph who in typology of the better Joseph Christ did that with every sin and temptation and yet never gave in. Onslaught after onslaught and onslaught. And Jesus consistently says, no, no, even in thought. But one day when he went into the house to do his work and none of the men of the house was there in the house, she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. Great answer, tough providence <laughs> in leaving his garment. And yet in God's providence, this gets him arrested, and we know how the rest of the story goes. Matthew 4. But then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now, was Jesus really tempted? Yes. Hebrews tells us he was tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. I didn't plan to do this in this Sunday school, but let me just ask the question anyway. Could Jesus have sinned? I think the answer is no. Uh, the classic doctrine of the impeccability of Christ, yeah, uh, passe non peccare, is that he was truly tempted, yet insofar as he is the son of God. Um, and yes, he's fully man, but he's also fully the son of God. He could not sin. Yeah, non pacificare He was not able for Adam to sin. Um, we can come back to that. That's a fun, fun one. But if you really have questions about it, I've got a good little book booklet for you. The tempter came to Jesus and said to him, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to the very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world 
and their glory. And he said to them, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. He's quoting here from what book three times? Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. One, just a great, this is just great practicality and how do you fight sin well? The word of God has to be written on your heart. I mean, he's there. He's ready with the sword of truth to do battle with temptation. Genesis 4, 6 through 8. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Think of the language that God gave to Eve. Your desire will be against your husband, but he will rule over you. Now, what does God say to Cain? Sin's desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Temptation came. His desire submitted. His heart and desire did not rule over, and therefore it produced sin. Any questions? Isn't there a difference between temptation and the practice of evil desires? Answer, God requires that we avoid entering into all forms of temptation. Temptation is not a sin when it originates outside of us. Temptation becomes sin when we entertain and welcome the sinful desires of our heart and act upon them. Next question. Are we able to make a distinction between entertaining a sinful desire and choosing to live in that desire? Are we able to make a distinction between entertaining a sinful desire and choosing to live in that desire? Answer. God condemns desires that are contrary to his law, as well as actual sins. These contrary desires are sinful, even if they are unchosen, since they proceed from a corrupt heart. All impure thoughts and desires prior to the conscious act of the will are considered sin in God's eyes. Look at some verses. Proverbs 6.25. Do not desire her beauty in your heart and do not let her capture you with her eyelashes. There it is. Don't, just don't desire her. Doesn't belong to you. She's not for you. She's not your wife. Do not desire her. Matthew 5, 27 and 28. You have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Here, it's not the act that's sinful. It's before the act, it's the desire that's sinful. You're already acting. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, there's change in motion happening in your mind. So, yes, you are already acting in your heart. Correct. Yep. And interestingly, you've already added another sin on top of that sin, the sin of cowardice. You're too afraid to, to play it out in reality. You're playing it out. And you're like, no, I don't want to. 1 Corinthians 10, 4 through 8. They drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. So we're talking about the Israelites um, in the wilderness. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things took place as examples for us, for Christians, that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in a single day. The sin follows the desire. They desired it, and then they did it. Galatians 5, 16 through 17. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, 
and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. There are desires that are in and of themselves sinful that you must not gratify. You must instantly, as quickly as you can, say, nope, I'm not going to entertain that. That's tough. That's where the word of God needs to be constantly ringing in your mind. I'll look at, I'll, I'll unpack this more next week, but personally, the desire to have a clean conscience is very powerful so that when desires erupt, I'm instantly thinking, okay, there's the desire. If I give into it, I know my conscience is not going to be clean. And I know what that's like. And, it, and, it's, and it's, it's soul crushing and dark and imprisoning. And, um, you know, you become, you become, um, what's the word when you're looking around your shoulder every second? Paranoid. What's that? Paranoid. paranoid. You become paranoid. What a horrible horrible way to live. And so instantly, all right, there's the, there's the desire. It's a bad desire. Father, I pray for a good conscience. Help me to have a good conscience, to walk in such a way that I don't have to look over my shoulder. That kind of instant battle, I think, is this, this struggle between the spirit and the flesh. Matthew 15, 19. For out of the heart come evil thoughts. You could stop right there. We've made our case. Murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. James 1, 14 through 15, each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desires. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Romans 2, for when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. There's a day when even the secrets of your heart will be under judgment, not just the actions, your secrets. Phil. Yeah, I don't know. No, it doesn't for me. It sounds like you're saying that the desire in and of itself is sinful. Is that correct? S some are. I mean, not all desire, but yeah. Sinful desire. Though. Yes. Like desire to commit a sin. Mm -hmm. And it's. it seems like there's still a moment of that sinful thought coming into your mind where you can deny it and not sin. Yes, you can deny it and not fall into further sin. I think, I think it's good and honoring to the Lord when that sinful desire erupts to say, Lord, oh, I hate my own heart. Where did that come from? Not a good place. Forgive me even for that thought. And the Lord is pleased that you've not gratified that desire. Um, and that's part of the battle, I think, to just call it what it is. I think you might actually be on the road to maybe losing the battle when you can say, well, all right, I, I didn't give into it. The desire might not have been bad. Like, I want I want to already say it's evil. Now, when Christ, this is the next question, we're forgiven and you confess it and uh, and you confess it and the Lord helps you um, overcome and rule those desires more and more so that even over time, those desires might not even pop up. I don't, I have no desire for um, smoking weed. I don't. In high school, before I was a believer, that desire hit me square in the face every morning when I woke up. And oftentimes, to my shame, I went to first period, you know, with eyes red and mind just in la-la land. The Lord saved me. I think I had that desire for another month or two, and I, I didn't give into it. And at this point in my life, you know, 
sadly, I smell weed increasingly uh, in, in the neighborhoods driving around. But I smell, I'm like, I don't think, you know what? I want to go get high. I don't at all. And that's not true with every desire. There are desires that I had before I was a believer that are still popping up. And I think the answer is, ah, I hate those desires. Does that make sense? It does. I, I just, I think at least maybe there is a distinction of entertaining a desire and the desire when it begins. And maybe that is further sin, like you had mentioned. Um, but you know, just I, I think in the way that we are tempted, in the way that Christ, if if knowing that we uh, Christ was tempted in all the ways that we are, but never sinned, um, I guess those sinful desires come from without, from the world and from Satan, and not from. So, so you would say that Christ never had a thought that would have been sinful if he would have acted upon it. Then, say that last part one more time. So, so you're saying that Christ would have never had a thought that would have been sinful if he would have acted upon it. Yeah, yeah. He never, he never had sinful desires. Hmm. We have sinful desires. He was tempted from the outside. Yeah, and we're also tempted from the outside. And, and um, it's, it is tough for us because that mixes already with a heart that's wayward. Um, now, I don't, I don't think that, that we should come to the conclusion, ah, Jesus doesn't know that. He's not a sympathetic, he can't really be a sympathetic high priest. No, he actually, he resisted temptation far more than we ever have um, because he never gave in. But I also want to say he never had a sinful desire bubble up within him. Romans 8, 5, for those who live according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. Any questions with, are we able, any more questions with, are we able to make a distinction between entertaining sinful desire and choosing to live in that desire? Next question then. What kinds of sinful desires and deeds does God's law condemn? What kinds of sinful de desires does, and deeds does God's law condemn? Answer, Christ teaches us this in summary in Matthew 15, 18 through 20. But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. Next question. Will God permit our sinful desires to go unpunished? Answer, certainly not. He is terribly angry with our sinful desires as well as our actual sin. So there's part of the answer too, Phil. He is terribly angry with our sinful desires as well as, in distinction, our actual sin. God will punish every idle thought, careless word, or wicked action by a just judgment both now and in eternity. As the Bible declares, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. And there's a whole host of passages that I will let you read in the interest of time. Next question. What has Jesus accomplished for me in the gospel with regard to all forms of sexual sin? What has Jesus accomplished for me in the gospel with regard to all forms of sexual sin? Answer. Through true faith in the promise of God's word and wholehearted trust in Christ by the gospel, God has freely granted not only to others but to me also the forgiveness of all my sexual trespasses, canceling all my guilt, and meriting for me eternal righteousness and salvation. John 17.3, John 17.7. 7. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Sanctify them in the truth, your word is true. We believe the promise of God's word. Hebrews 11, 1 through 3. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their command, commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible, highlighting the nature of faith. Romans 5, 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, 
We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Dear friends, all of us in here have sinful desires. <laughs> and all of us in here have acted on sinful desires. And praise God for Romans 5.1, that since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Period. Say amen. You can go to bed now at night and recount all the sinful desires and all the ways you've acted on them and even miss probably the vast majority of them and still close your eyes in good conscience and confidence that God says, ah, my son or daughter, peace, peace, go to sleep well. You've been justified. You've been declared righteous. Praise God for Jesus. Um, John Murray, his last words before he died, says, I'm thankful to God for the act of righteousness of Christ. Thank you, Jesus lived righteously on my account. Thank you, Lord. Romans 10, 10, and 11, for with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes of him will not be put to shame. Any questions there? Good news. Through true faith in the promise of God's word and wholehearted trust in Christ by the gospel, God has freely granted, not only to others, but to me also, the forgiveness of all my sexual trespasses, canceling all my guilt, and meriting for me eternal righteousness and salvation. Question. Next question. How does the truth of the gospel set us free with regard to sexual sin? How does the truth of the gospel set us free with regard to sexual sin? Answer. Since I died, was buried, and have been raised with Christ through his death and resurrection, I am set free from slavery to any form of sexual sin. Christ has broken its dominion over me, and I now live with a renewed desire to reckon myself dead to my old way of sexual immorality, but alive to God and pursuing a sexually pure life for his glory. You could do no better if this truth is glorious to you and you want it to be more and more true of you, that you believe it. You could do no better than spending the rest of your life meditating on Romans 6. Romans chapter 6, I think, is the pinnacle of this truth. Romans 6, 1 through 4. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who die to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Now in verses 5 through 14, for we have been united with him in a death like his. We shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know. It's true that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Just think of the logic here. Because it is true that Christ has been put to death and then raised to new life, and because it is true that by faith we are one with him and therefore we have spiritually been put to death and raised to new life, the, the absolute necessary conclusion is that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. And we know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So, and here's, here's the imperative for all of us. You also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Every day when we're facing temptation, when we're wrestling with our own sinful desires of our heart, we, we, we consider, we actively remember and confess and believe, you know what? I'm dead to sin and I'm alive to God in Christ Jesus. I don't have to do this. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. So this is an indicative truth. This is true of you if you're in Christ. All right, we're out of time.
<laughs> yeah, just a quick fact check. Um, the quote is, I'm so thankful for the active obedience of Christ. What and did it I was, say? Uh, uh, active righteousness, I think. Yeah. And it was uh, in a letter from J. Gresham Machen to John Murray. Thank you. So it was Machen's basically Thank last you, words. community notes. Great. <laughs> I had to Google that, so. Yeah. We'll look at the uh, other two questions next week, and, um, and I'm gonna, I'll add a, another couple of questions uh, for part three of the sin of lust. Father, we thank you for this time. Oh Lord, we have just drank from a, um, a fire hydrant of scripture. And yet, Lord, may we not drown under the weight of its truth, but may we be nourished by its waters of life, by your spirit. Apply it to our hearts, Lord, that we would leave here finding and grounding our identity in Christ and who you've made us to be in Christ so that we indeed might put to death every sin and wayward desire. We pray in Jesus' name.